Hello, everyone, and welcome to Developing an Asset Prioritization Program webinar. I'm Sean Taylor. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to welcome and encourage you to engage with our expert today by using the Q&A box located in the right corner of your GoToWebinar interface. We will try to answer as many questions as possible during the last 15 minutes to 20 minutes of the webinar. Please note that all phone lines will be muted during this webinar. And after the webinar, we will send an email with a link to watch the webinar on demand. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Greg Brazo, sales engineer at Innovise. Greg is a regional sales manager and asset management subject matter expert for Innovise, serving much of the western half of the United States. Greg works primarily with a range of large and small city, local, and private water and wastewater entities. He focuses strongly on asset management solutions, which can include GIS and procedure audits, as well as planning efforts for a range of organization-wide asset types. With a background in both engineering and software, specializing in hydraulic modeling and asset performance modeling solutions, Greg is well-equipped to find effective and efficient solutions for clients. Greg, I will hand it off to you now. Thanks, Sean. Can everybody hear me all right? Good, excellent. Okay, so thanks for joining us today. And uh, just wanted to start with a quick agenda. Today what we're gonna focus on is going to be a little more on the high level than you're used to from folks over here at Innovise. We obviously are in the technological solutions department. And uh, what I wanna do is talk a little bit about overall asset management to start off with. We're actually not going to spend a ton of time on overall asset management, but I think it's really important to frame the conversation and uh, <clears throat> how some solutions that we have to offer under the uh, Innovise banner fit into the um, into overall plans. And so uh, then we'll move on to Info Asset Planner. Now, Info Asset Planner is our flagship flagship uh, prioritization and planning program. And it came from uh, lots and lots of iterations and discussions with clients like those of you who are on, on board here today. I uh, just want to talk about how it came to be, kind of why it came to be, just very briefly. Uh, but most importantly are the bottom two bullets that are here. We, we really want to discuss what it takes to get from point A to point B when you are setting up an overall asset prioritization program. And it involves things like establishing goals and sticking to them, as well as the actual implementation of the software and the overall program itself. So let's talk overall asset management. Now, asset management is a very, very large thing. And again, we do a very small chunk of the pie, but a very important chunk of the pie. And the reason we came to develop uh, Info Asset Planner has a lot to do with some of the utility planning challenges that we've seen for years and years um, <clears throat> out there with various clients of ours. And so just about everybody is dealing with most of the bubbles that you see on here on this screen. So number one, aging assets. Assets, generally speaking, are not getting any younger. And so a lot of municipalities are struggling with how much re renewal efforts does my utility really need? And when am I gonna do that stuff? And that tees into the next bubble, which is budgeting. So everybody's kind of in a little bit of a balancing act, trying to figure out how much is too much to spend on my assets in the ground, and then what's too little. That's, that's what's called establishing an, an, an effective level of service. And so most folks that are probably on today are, are not in the too much category there when it comes to budgeting. Most, most organizations that I've spoken with over the years are, are far into the too little on the side of budgeting. As far as main breaks and sewer capacity for distribution and collection systems, people out there are trying to figure out why a pipe failed. It's all about the analytics. What were the what were the leading causes? What were the things that led a pipe to break? Because obviously we want to avoid that. Um, and then do we make some wrong decisions 
as far as replacements or even repairs. So did we plan to replace the pipe too soon? Did we plan to repair it too soon? All this involves going back and digging into the data that we use to, to create our prioritization program, generally speaking. As far as rate increases, you're all dealing with it and we're aware of this. Um, the key with rate increases is really how you justify those increases to the folks who are paying the bills, to the folks that you're providing service to. And so in a lot of cases, just because water and wastewater systems are out of sight, out of mind, it can be difficult to justify why you're spending, um, why you're taking the funding that you are and dumping it into system in a certain way. Um, in a lot of cases, that's difficult to convey to your ratepayers because they're not doing your jobs day in and day out. They're just turning water on at the tap and they're flushing toilets, they're dumping it down the drain, and all they care about is that it gets to their house and then it gets away from their house. And so finally, what I've got up here is one that's kind of near and dear to my own heart here. And uh, that is an aging workforce. So we're, we're constantly aging. And um, one of the challenges that presents is we, we really need to be conscious as organizations in the utilities world and water wastewater of capturing knowledge from retiring operations staff and folks in the planning realm as well. Um, it, is, it is super critical because a lot of the folks that have been there for 20 years, for 30 years at municipalities, they have a lot of stuff up in their head and capturing that knowledge is a, is a concerted effort on the part of a lot of folks that we work with uh, just to make sure that we digitize and we make that data, that knowledge that those folks who are on their way out, getting ready to retire, have in their in their own brains up there. It's key to be able to capture that information and then move it on to the next the next generation who's going to be running the utility moving forward. So, asset management as a whole, I think we're past uh, convincing folks that asset management is a good thing. So there's lots of benefits that that come with it. Um, things that I've seen are improved communication. So some of you may be familiar, and I've, I've seen this with very large districts. A lot of very large districts operate in silos. And it's just a function of, hey, we've got lots and lots of people that are involved in our organization, and we operate best by working in these individual silos. And they're usually business process related. Um, but you gotta get out of that, that silo mentality and asset management, if you're looking organization-wide, can really help with that. Um, asset management will get you to putting the horse before the cart. We talk about putting the cart before the horse all the time. Um, a lot of folks are out there right now, and this applies to data in general. A lot of folks have, have just gathered up so darn much data at the moment that they're coming to us and they're saying, well, gosh, we don't even know what to do with it. That's that's a cart before the horse situation. What's key with asset prioritization and asset management is that you establish your business processes to put, put the horse before the, before the cart. Because what that will lead to is things like lower total costs of ownership, a better streamlined business process system, and it's the old car metaphor. So if you do the required maintenance on your system, if you do the required inspections on your system, you're not gonna break down in the middle of the night, or chances are much lower that your system is gonna bust on you in the middle of the night. You're always gonna have stuff like that, but you'll, you'll be able to lower the amount of times it does happen, and that leads to a lower total cost of ownership. And so what this is, is just moving to being proactive instead of being reactive to things in the system. Now, a lot of the times getting, getting too proactive involves a lot of high level, critical thinking it even involves staffing decisions and and we've been involved in in uh kind of on, on the on the sidelines when those decisions have been made um and we'll get into how those things how we've seen those things happen in the past but at the end of the day what we're trying to do is extend asset life make sure we are we're keeping the appropriate level of service for our system as a whole and then in doing all of this, we're ensuring succession planning within the workforce. So these are just some of the benefits that come with asset management, generally speaking. And so I am not gonna get super duper in, into this, but this chart is straight out of ISO 55000, which some of you may be familiar with. And it's really asset management at the highest level. 
And so asset management is much greater than the analytics that we provide. Um, it's, it's, it's dealing with staffing information. It's dealing with your customers. It's even getting into legislation and working with investors. Um, it's about developing an organizational strategic plan, but planning and prioritization has a huge part and a huge role in, in, in the decisions that you make as an organization. And, and it boils down to, hey, how can, we, how can we keep our system as healthy as possible while delivering the acceptable level of service that we've defined? So we specialize in the things that you see there in, in that yellow orange, which is strategy and planning. In green, we've got asset management decision making. And then in purple, the asset information. Those things kind of tee together in the solutions that we have to offer in the info asset world. And those are the chunks of the pie that we specialize in. We're very, very good at that thing. But to us, that is the most critical piece of the asset management pie. There, there are folks that are in the CMMS world, um, in, the, in the large district sector that um, are very good at what they do. We at Innovize, we're very, very good at this critical piece of asset prioritization and planning. And we've, we've, we've gotten to that point by working with municipalities like those on the phone to understand what the pain points are and what types of analysis they're trying to perform. Um, and in a lot of cases, we worked with districts that have a system in place for um, assessing what risk looks like in their system um, and acting on the riskiest pipes in a system and, and trying to do the right things. Uh, but one of the things that we bring to the table with the info asset platform and some of our other tools is redundancies and uh, a medium in order to be able to hand off a tool that's been developed to the next generation of folks that are going to be involved in planning and prioritization. So let's talk a little bit about technology and innovation in government. So it's kind of challenging what we deal with in water and wastewater. You know, if you if you look at other business sectors that are differently funded, I like to ask this question when I usually talk to folks, but why do you think we're we're lagging? And really what it comes down to is funding. And I think that most people would agree it's not just the the type of funding and the amount of funding, but it's the method through which we get the funding to do anything with our water and wastewater systems. We lag to other business sectors like oil and natural gas and manufacturing because those are for-profit industries. And we're not necessarily a for-profit industry on the whole. There are organizations that are out there that are for-profit only, but people that are um, governing water and wastewater systems for the most part um, are dealing with enterprise funds. They're, 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 really, they're really dealing with a different funding mechanism than we see in, in these other business sectors. And so as a result of all of that, funding does tend to be a challenge. So that's one thing. But we lag in technology and innovation due to, in, in some part, and myself included in this, the, the folks that are involved. So we've got a lot of engineers and planners and you know, I, I prefer tried and true myself. And so I've, you know, over the years, I've had to kind of get out of the box a little bit and uh, entertain different technologies as I've evolved in my career. Um, and just look at what else is out there. You know, th those folks that, that have been there for 20 years, for 30 years at municipalities, they know what, what works. And in a lot of cases, they're a little bit nervous to try something new. So we also lag due to that municipal red tape. To get anything done at a municipality, in a lot of cases, involves a year to a year and a half budgeting cycle. And um, we see that every day at Innovise as we work with our clients in the public sector. And we also, we also lag due to just skepticism and nervous, nervousness. And again, that it also kind of tees into that first tried and true engineers and planners uh, bullet that we have there. We see folks that are really skeptical skeptical of new technology. And probably the best example of this that I've seen over the years is what we were looking at when it came to migrating from CAD to GIS. Now, as a young engineer straight out of college, I was immediately exposed within the utilities world to CAD. And that was where everything was done. 
that was what I was tasked with doing day in and day out. And so it took a little bit of convincing and we had to have the conversations here in house at Innovise with some of our clients about why GIS is a better option. CAD, it's lines and text for the most part. There are some exceptions to that, but GIS is very much designed um, for managing large systems, information that's, that's already out there, properties, what's the material of a pipe, when was it installed, how long is it, where is it, what's it buried beneath, all this information sits really well in a GIS environment and uh, what we've seen over the years is folks eventually come to the point where they're adopting GIS and really embracing it, but it took a lot of convincing, um, both I think at the municipal level and in-house here at Innovise as well. So let's talk a little bit about Info Asset Planner and how it's come to be. So this tool in some form or fashion has been around for quite some time. Now, for those of you who have worked with us for a bit, you may recognize tools like Cap Plan Water and Cap Plan Sewer. Cap Plan being standing for Capital Planning, um, and we had tools with Cap Plan uh, Water and Sewer that used to integrate with our hydraulic modeling platforms. Now, our hydra hydraulic modeling platforms have been our bread and butter really since 1996 here at Innovise. And early on, as people were building um, asset management programs, in a lot of cases, the folks that knew the most about systems inside municipalities tended to be the folks who were governing or overseeing hydraulic models. And so it was only logical that we stuck our capital planning tools just as direct extensions of our hydraulic modeling software. And so as these groups evolved and the people who were involved in asset management programs types of people evolved. What we found is that we were getting a lot, lot more folks in the planning side of things, in the GIS side of things, um, that got to be a part of the greater asset management effort at municipalities. And what we saw was there wasn't a lot, there weren't a lot of folks who were really super insistent on having their hydraulic modeling information inside the same environment as their planning and prioritization system. And that's how InfoMaster came to be. And so obviously you can still get that sort of information into InfoMaster because, well, dealing with any Innovise tools, for the most part, you're dealing with stuff that integrates with GIS and pretty much anything that you generate from a hydraulic modeling standpoint, velocities and, and flows, those things that you might leverage in a risk assessment uh, tool can be pulled because of their their because of their nature, because they're spatial or because they are tabular into the InfoMaster platform. And so obviously we've recently made the move. We're starting to transition folks onto the latest and greatest, which is now the Info Asset Planner tool. So, um, but our functionality has evolved over the course of time. We've got different modules. We've built our tools based on what we've heard from lots of our end users, and I think Info Asset Planner is at a really good spot right now. So if you look at traditional InfoMaster customers, um, <clears throat> these are the folks that will be migrating at some point in the next year or two over to Info Asset Planner. We've got a great representation here throughout the country. I've, I've had the pleasure of being involved in um, a lot of these efforts, predominantly throughout the West, the uh, Pacific Northwest, and uh, here in Colorado where I'm based. Uh, as well as the Southwest. And uh, what's key is, you know, it's been a different story every time. And so over the course of time when I've been working with these organizations who have deployed InfoMaster historically and now Info Asset Planner, there's a lot of front end work that, that seems to go into it that I think should be discussed. And um, it involves becoming mature in asset prioritization, not in asset management overall. That's also important. But becoming mature in asset prioritization is also key. And this goes for districts of any size, whether you're small, whether you're large. And we'll get into that in a little bit. There's a little bit of a different approach that smaller districts take as compared to medium to medium to sized districts take as compared to larger sized districts. And so, but the, the central the, the key with all of these organizations, whether you're big or small, is finding synergy between three things. It's people, 
its processes, and its technology. So no two districts are formed the same as, as far as how they're set up from a staffing standpoint, who's in charge, what are the roles, even at the management level, it varies a little bit from district to district that we work with. And so you have to look at things from the top down. Who's going to be involved in asset prioritization moving forward? And what's their role going to be? Same thing applies to processes. Every district does different things. Some districts uh, oversee um, electrical efforts. Some districts don't. Some, some districts are water only. Some districts are sewer only. Some districts have combined systems. So there's, there's lots of different processes that go into um, districts of different types. And again, no, no two are the same. And technology, you know, if you look around at what's out there now, there's lots of stuff that you can get to help you in your efforts for managing your system, your GIS information, and what's the repository for all that. Um, there's lots of different technologies that people employ based on their own needs, um, and everybody is, again, slightly different. And so what I've seen over the years going into the people side of things is, you know, with medium and large organizations, uh, what's been really fascinating to watch over the years is um, <clears throat> I've seen these asset management focus groups that have come about. And so I strongly encourage folks to consider establishing something like this. Now, an asset management focus group um, involves bringing people from all, wa all walks of life inside your organization, from finance, from planning, from engineering, uh, from operations. What's key to a successful asset prioritization effort and then greater greater asset management effort is really involving folks from different walks of life inside the organization. That is how you build a program that's actually going to be seen forward into the future and continued. What you really don't want is to start, put together a great program, and then without an asset management focus group or somebody to see it forward, um, in a lot of cases, you run the risk of seeing the program die, which is, uh, which would be just a, a shame. Uh, but we've seen it kind of here and there. For the most part, I think districts are really looking to make sure these focus groups last and get seen forward into the future. As far as all organizations, whether you're big or small, um, what's key is really identifying your go-getters. So the folks that are going to take that extra step outside their current job function, unless of course you're employing something, somebody specifically to be the head of an asset management focus group, which I haven't seen a lot. You have to identify those folks that, that are motivated, uh, that know what they're doing, that are excited, because those are the people that are gonna guide a group like an asset management focus group into the future. Additionally, you've got to get people, like I said a little bit earlier, from different parts of an organization. That is how you ensure that you have a successful program when it comes to prioritization. Everybody kind of needs a little bit of a say for the overall organization as to what matters, and it should change over the course of time. Your, your goals will change. How you look at risk will change. How you prioritize things will change over the course of time. And so what's key is that you, you continue to have input from folks that are in different walks of life within the organization. Uh, what's also key, and something that I've seen a lot of municipalities being conscious of, is that you look for a good age range. You can't just have your managers that have been around for 20 years be part of these groups, because that is not how you see things into the future when you're putting these groups together. You need to identify and keep people that are involved in these focus groups. Um, and you need to figure out who's in it for the long haul. Now you won't, unfortunately in today's job climate, you won't necessarily always be able to keep everyone who's involved in a group like that. But that being said, what tends to happen is these go-getters within an organization, you know, they tend to stick around. And a lot of people in the municipal world are very proud of what they do. They're, they're, they're excited to talk about it both at home and at conferences, and you, you can keep those folks if you keep them engaged. And I think that's super key in the world of asset prioritization. And what is, what is absolutely critical is finding that champion, that person who is gonna be the leader of the focus group now and into the future. And then of course, if you run into a situation where that person moves along, 
um, or you want to cycle. I've seen folks um, actual, actually cycle the leader for an asset management focus group in order to keep different um, different business lines within a municipality engaged in an asset management prioritization effort. Um, but what's key is that you establish who that person is and, and recognize that they're the leader and make sure that you communicate that to the other folks in the group. And then each of those individuals from each business line should be responsible for disseminating information that gets put together, decisions that are made within the organization to their greater groups in their normal job function. So we've got our first polling question that's coming up here. And that polling question is, has your organization considered or developed an asset management focus group of any kind? And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Sean to throw up the options that are up there. So we'll give it about um, 45 seconds in order to figure out what you got. Uh, we like to let people give their responses in here so that we can kind of understand who's in, the, who's in the room and what situation that you're in. And so we'll start from there. Okay, Sean, what kind of results are we seeing in there? Very good. Okay, so moving right along. Let's talk about people a little bit further. Um, talking about workforce in general. Um, what's really interesting, something that's a little bit of a, a recent trend, is because of the, the surge of technology and how we use it, um, our workforce is, is changing in interesting ways. Uh, most notably, if you look at some of the larger organizations that we work with, uh, they're starting to employ a position in-house that is um, it's called a CIO, Chief Information Officer. Now this concept has been around for quite some time, uh, but we have this quote from Ernst & Young down there, and what's really interesting to see is that when you look at C-suite executives, um, what we're finding is the, the age of that individual who represents the CIO tends to be younger and younger over the years and uh, notably younger than some of those other C-suite executives. And I think a lot of this has to do with technology. That's the person that's um, governing what happens from a technological standpoint in-house at a municipality. Um, and we've got, look, in our workforce, we've got five different generations that are represented here. And, and folks on the younger generations have been the ones that are, are driving technology. But folks that have been in industry for a while they're coming, they're coming on, uh, right on board and have been for the last five years or so. It's been very interesting to see the uptick in adoption of technology when it comes to generational um, brackets that we have there. So the next, the next uh, part of the Venn diagram that we had there was, was process. So people, process, and technology. So as far as process is concerned, when you're building a prioritization program, establishing your direction is super critical. So where are we going? It's it's essentially putting the horse before the cart. So instead of the instead of the opposite. So establishing establishing that direction is super critical, and that involves in a lot of cases a focus group. Doesn't always, but you can't just start collecting data. And we've seen this time and again. You can't just start collecting data because somebody from a sensor organization has told you to. Um, has told you it's critical. It is critical to get good data. Um, but you need to know where you're going with that data and why you're collecting it. So you need to come up with information like what what are our established inputs to whatever decision-making process we're going to employ when it comes to risk assessment and planning and prioritization. So that's one thing that you need to employ. Another thing is what are our expected outputs? So w w what are the decisions that we're actually gonna make based on dumping all that input information into a centralized platform. Um, and you need to justify the why, really. So there has to be a reason you're collecting data, there has to be a, a reason that you're crunching the data, 
who gets the final say on what that looks like? Well, I would argue in most cases it comes down to that focus group we talked about. Um, doesn't always. So for smaller smaller districts that employ a similar process to you know what we do here in house, um, in some cases that could just be one person who's running a plan, planning and prioritization effort in house, and so they get the final say. But what's important is somebody does get that final say, and they are the uh, they're kind of the governing authority over their asset prioritization program. Um, another hypercritical thing in the process side is how often are we going to revisit this thing? So I have seen anything from organizations that deal with daily, so day in and day out prioritization, re reprioritization. They have four people involved, five people involved, ten people involved. And what we see is they will gather so much data over the course of a single day that they actually want to revisit their prioritization process um, that frequently. I've also seen districts that go, you know what? We only want to touch this thing once every six months. And so that's kind of the range that we've seen. It goes anywhere from daily to six months, but it's critical that you establish how often you're going to revisit things as you're talking about process on the on the front end of a of prioritization efforts and some of the conversations that, that we get um, fortunately involved in. Um, finally, <clears throat> how can we acquire quality data for use with any technology? So uh, this is super critical, and I'm actually going to I'm actually going to pop to the next slide and talk about this. I have a few to, to discuss here. So acquiring quality data is key because if you have data that's really not up to snuff, um, while it's still doable as far as establishing the processes, you can justify working individual processes for making decisions, risk assessment, planning, and prioritization decisions. But if you don't have the data, the results at the end of the day may not be something that you're going to want to work with. And so you need to ensure that there are procedures in place to, uh, to make sure that you've got good data on the back end. It's the input data. So the data sets that we're most commonly looking at here at Innovise when people are deploying InfoAsset, uh, it's GIS information, which frankly historically has not been all that great. Failure history data, rehab data, CMMS data, or asset management system data, basically your day in, day out work order system. These are the type of data sets that we've seen folks really employing. Now, what's interesting about GIS is that GIS is, is a great system right now. And we're collecting, in a lot of cases, great data right now. As we install things, we're collecting good data as it goes into the ground. Um, and that is the process side of things. What, what we've dealt with in the past in GIS is, as GIS has come about, what we've seen is we're looking at as-builts from, you know, 20, 30, 50, 80 years ago, and we're, we're kind of taking a stab as to what's actually in the ground. So, um, so it's key to ensure that your data sets are quality or identify that you need to improve them moving forward. Um, <clears throat> as far as quantity of data, so quality is important, quantity of data is also important. So I found this statistic uh, really fascinating. Now this is from all of two years ago. And there's a stat that's in there that is 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years, which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, makes sense, right? We've had these new devices and uh, everybody's walking around with a smartphone, uh, but these things have grown and the amount of data that, that we are collecting has grown exponentially. So sensors and devices and enterprise data that you see on the right side of this graph, I mean, it's just shooting through the roof. So the sheer data volume uh, was doubling every 12 months, even two years ago. Um, so you can only imagine what it's doing right now. But what is super key is not just to collect uh, vast vats of data. What's key is establishing processes to get quality data. So this applies not just to the water wastewater industry, but it really applies to every industry. And I was doing some, some searching around when I was uh, doing a little bit of research, putting this presentation together. And um, what I found is this, if you look at the upper left-hand corner, the chart that we've got there, the bar graph, excuse me, um, it doesn't really matter what business industry you're in. 
uh, across the board, data quality and cleanliness, because every industry is, is consuming data, it really doesn't matter what industry you're in, data quality and cleanliness seems to be the biggest concern. So it's not just us. It's at the top of the list for us, and it's at the top of the list for other, um, for other business processes and, and other industries, because we aren't there yet. And so um, I think we're working on it. And what I've seen really in the last five years is that there, there have been folks that have established good processes in-house to collect that quality data. But quite frankly, we just aren't even close at this point. So I think move, things are moving in the right direction. But as I was mentioning a little bit before, if you take junk data and you plug it into an algorithm and you take the results from that algorithm, that decision-making process at phase value, and just move with them, um, you're going to be making decisions on, on garbage in some cases. Um, what's really neat about the info asset platform is that you can, you can build your processes and reuse them time and again as you continue to collect better data. It's also really easy to use the platform in order to identify spots where you may not have great data and prioritize efforts to go collect better data in there. So you, your analysis is only as good as the data that you're using um, as input data. Third piece of the Venn diagram is technology. And so, as you might imagine, I think that most municipalities that we work with, um, everybody's structured a little bit differently and you all have different needs. And so you're all asking the question of what different technology are we using and why? What can we benefit from? And because of the way you're structured, there's different answers for everybody. So GIS we see just about everywhere. So these are just some of the common ones that we see. GIS technology, um, I think for for um, just for the greater good here, is a great platform to really build any sort of analysis tool in, and we see that at Innovise, which is why that we've uh, which is why we've bolted on a lot of our um, assessment tools, software tools into the GIS platform. And so we see GIS almost across the board. In most organizations, we're also um, seeing people employ the use of hydraulic models. These are both distribution systems models and collection systems models. So it'd be InfoWater um, on the distribution system side of things, InfoWater Pro, and things like ICM, InfoSwim, InfoSewer, XP Swim, the things that we have on the collection system side of things for hydraulic models. Uh, but different organizations have employed different combinations of those things, and there's different ways that you can use those in prioritization uh, programs. Uh, CMMS-related information, uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of uh, asset management systems, as they like to brand themselves, computerized maintenance management systems that are out there, the CityWorks of the world, the Lucities, the Cartographs, the iWaters, um, so, and, and others as well. But everybody's employing a different one of these software tools to collect information on failure history data. How do we operate our system day in and day out from a staffing standpoint? What are we doing? Storing work orders, where do they go? Service requests, documenting, that sort of stuff. And then organizations are, are collecting regularly SCADA information and CCTV information. And there's a there's the right blend of all these things based on quality and the amount of data that you have and how much you believe in each of these things. There's the right blend of these with any district to employ with any planning and prioritization effort. So really, again, it's you have to find that, that sweet spot between people, process, and technology um, <clears throat> in order to be able to come up with the right system for your organization as a whole when you go to deploy a tool like Info Asset Planner. So as far as technology, again, is concerned, what's critical is that you establish a, a strategy for the future. I touched on this a little bit. We are just consuming vast quantities of data. We're collecting vast quantity, quantities of data, and you need to come up with a process for not just collecting it, but you need to develop a strategy for how you're going to use it in the future. Because I would predict in the next five years or so, we're going we're gonna to run into a lot of municipalities that say, hey, we kind of wish that we actually hadn't collected all this data because we really 
can't do anything with it. So it's really important that you be strategic about where you're collecting data and why. And then you need a process for rounding out the different types of data that you're going to be collecting. Again, you need to look holistically uh, from a data management standpoint and, and see what data you're collecting and why. And, um, you know, we our tool can really give you a lot of options as far as input data. We can pull in CCTV information, GIS information, CMMS information, any tabular data can go into our analytics platform and the InfoAcid tools that we have to offer. But, you know, you have to be, you have to be digesting good data um, that's been put in place strategically in order to get the best benefit out of the analytics tools. And then, of course, with technology, you've got some gurus that use this in-house in a lot of cases. Maybe it's one person, maybe it's five people in-house that use vast, um, vastly different types of technology. What's critical is that you, you, you are able to provide the output from the analytics platforms that you have in place in formats that people who aren't your tech gurus can understand. And you have to be able to convey um, things and decisions that you make within your analytics platforms uh, to the general public um, thereafter as well. And so we like to be able to provide tools that will do that. So here's the next polling question. What is your organization's biggest challenge in becoming more mature with respect to asset planning and prioritization? And so I'm gonna give it about 45 seconds and we'll talk about each one of them. A lot of folks are dealing with um, staffing issues and you know asset management groups that I've seen over the course of time um, dealing with maybe somebody is just not taking charge inside of an asset management group. Maybe it's not a priority. Maybe it's something that's not believed in at the uh, at the highest level. These sorts of things. And so we we see a lot of um, we see the whole gamut really of involvement as far as um, people becoming more mature with respect to asset management and prioritization. And so we we always like to ask this question when we get into uh, places just to understand where we're kind of sitting and the people that we're talking to. So what's interesting here is most folks have said, it looks like it's 38%, that there's just not enough time in the day. And um, just barely, because um, <clears throat> that's actually neck and neck with people. So we also are seeing from the folks that are on the webinar at this point in time, there's lack of buy-in from key players. So I've I've seen all of this stuff over the course of time. Some some interesting input. It's been a while since we've asked this in a um, in a large format discussion. So so finally, we'll talk a little bit about implementation and seeing it through. So you have to put the planning into prioritization efforts and, and asset management focus groups up front. But where you see it through is in the implementation phase of any technology deployment. And so um, ensuring quality data and building on a good GIS base is, is huge, in my opinion. And um, this is what we've kind of, you know, we've made the info asset platform for over the course of years. Um, <clears throat> it's there as not just an analytics tool, uh, but a tool to be able to help you identify where you're maybe not getting the best type of data and give you uh, give you the ability to um, run some numbers and kind of figure out where your data could be improved. And so um, that is key in an implementation process, ensuring that quality data. Because if you don't have it, again, it's garbage in, garbage out. What my um, <clears throat> first recommendation is for folks who are just getting started with data collection that don't feel like they're in a good spot, my first recommendation is always to ensure that you've got the good the good data. And um, for most organizations, what what that means, especially when it comes to pipes and manholes and uh, and pumps, things that are critical to a water or wastewater system, you have to you have to establish things like what what material a pipe is made of, what's the age of a pump, how often is it serviced, those sorts of things. And you also have to ensure that you have good spatial data sets. That means GIS. Uh, means information that might even be in spreadsheets. 
And so how do you convey that spreadsheet information over into, a, into something that you can actually use? A lot of that ties into um, to, uh, making a, a unique identifier available. So if you have a pipe, um, it's got a unique identifier in GIS. You can still utilize spreadsheets that reference that unique identifier, even if they're not physically within the GIS environment. So super critical to ensure that you have quality data. Um, getting asset management and historical data into the fold is key in implementation. So things like the number of breaks that you have in a system, uh, number of cave-ins, the number of leaks, depending on what types of systems that you're actually running, whether it's water, water or wastewater. And then you, you really need to establish a link between work activity and affected assets. It's, hey, we're dumping all this effort into maintaining our system. If you're not tracking the work that you're doing in the field and bringing it back, you, you really, you're really not getting the big picture. So you, you, you have to have a process that's in place during the implementation. You need to make sure that there's a process in place for linking those things. And then identifying risk and performance factors. And so this is where we really shine and have for quite some time. So it, we can run analytics where we can help you determine where failure is going to impact service. And so I think this is super critical. And um, you need to get out there and discuss with your rate payers. Uh, what they're worried the most about, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that you're really beholden to. You don't want to wind up in the newspaper, and that's why we employ asset management, asset prioritization programs. It's to make sure that we can get to pipes that need to be addressed, get to manholes that need to be addressed that are risky sooner rather than later, and that is really the name of the game. And then finally, we've got um, <clears throat> feeding back data into an asset database. And so GIS is the natural place to throw it to, um, quite honestly, because it really is that centralized repository. And so what you, what you need to do is make sure that if they're not there already, you need to make sure that there are internal procedures that will allow you to get the data, get the calculations that you make um, <clears throat> back into the system and so that you can use it again and again and see it forward into the future. And then, of course, make sure that you're leveraging existing technology to its fullest and new computer technology as it's, as it's coming on board now. Uh, we mess, I mentioned these asset management focus groups that I've seen uh, over the course of the years. What I'm starting to see as well is technology focus groups. And so it's not just about asset management, it's kind of where are we going with technology. It's in the same vein, um, but what I've kind of seen is that they're getting folks from all walks of life at some municipalities, and they're figuring out, hey, we've got all these software applications, how can we best tie them to one another? And with uh, the modern advent of APIs and you know ability to share data back and forth across databases and interfaces, this is getting easier and easier, but again, we're collecting so much information at the moment that um, it's starting to get to the point where we need to have discussions about the best ways to tie things um, together. So now for our final polling question, how can we, meaning Innovise, better support you and your business needs? And so there's lots of ways that we can do that. Again, we work with, uh, most of the larger municipalities, medium and large size municipalities in the country. It's not to say that we work with everyone, uh, but we always like to understand what the best route forward is for helping our customer, customers moving forward. So do you want to be contacted to learn more? Do you want us to come by to run a demo of what we have to offer in the info asset realm? Um, and then let us know if you're interested in learning about training opportunities, or just let us know that, hey, I don't have any questions at this time. And so we'll give it a few more seconds before we close out the poll here. All right. Thank you very much. So that's all we have to offer today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and pass it off to Sean and Colin. We've got... Uh, Sounds like we've got a few questions that are coming in here, and I wanted to address a few of these. So uh, first question that came up during the presentation, what can be done to ensure a GIS is mature enough to be used for accurate 
informative prioritization outputs? And so that's a great question. So I think you're always dealing with a, with a moving target. And really what it comes down to is ensuring that you have a, a GIS group that understands what they have put together. And so a GIS manager is, is probably not gonna lie to you. Um, GIS managers understand their systems uh, really, really well. And in a lot of cases, especially the ones who have been around for a while, um, a GIS manager tends to be the one who can really speak to the quality of the data. Now, it's involving that person, and again, it, this kind of tees into what I was talking about. It's involving that person in, in an overall um, asset management focus group. And so I think as a, as, a, as a greater group, if you start having discussions about it, you know, there's only been one organization that I've, vis I've visited in the last six years that I said, you know, you you are just not in the you're you're just not there yet as far as data inputs to be able to do a um, a planning and prioritization effort at the moment. So most groups really are, um, but you know the key is understanding that you have hey we have pipes in our system. Here's where they are. Here's how old they am. Here's how old they are, and here's what they're made of. That's really the starting point. So let's see, we've got another question coming in here. What about historical data that's missing and or lacking in confidence? Well, that that's key, okay? So if you have historical data that's missing, you need to be able to identify that information. And actually the, the Info Asset Planner tool is very good at pointing that missing data out. Um, Lacking in confidence is a little bit of a different different approach, but if you just flat out don't have, you have a field that's not populated within our tool, um, it's very easy to to suss it out of the data. So, and what we can do with that is you can identify assets where that particular data is um, and drive up the risk associated with each of those, those assets. You can drive it up exponentially if it's something, if it's a field that really, really matters to you, and then Info Asset Planner has been developed to then take uh, your data and dump it off to both our own uh, our own homegrown CMMS with Info Asset Manager or to lots and lots of the larger systems. So Info Asset Manager is really designed for some of our very small clients that really aren't um, there yet on the GIS side of things. But um, <clears throat> you can really identify where you're lacking in data just by the fact that it's missing. As far as lacking in confidence, that actually, data lacking in confidence needs to be identified as you're putting together your focus groups. And so somebody has to speak up in those focus groups and say, hey, listen, I really, I really don't feel good about that. And in most cases, you are able to, to pare down the data that you're talking about. So it could be, hey, we have a, um, we had a contractor that installed a, a group of pipes between uh, that we used regularly at the city to in install pipes between 1950 and 1954. And what we found over the years is that um, those pipes didn't last. Uh, same materials we found with other contractors. But if you have that information populated, it's at least a way that you can uh, mine out the information then use it effectively and identify it as data that's lacking in confidence. You can then grab that and start making decisions uh, about those assets that you don't have quality data with, and then um, actually go to act on it. So create work orders and deploy them within your work order systems to get out there and collect information for those data, uh, for those assets where you have um, questions. Let's see here. Is there a different license needed for Info Asset Planner if you already have Info Master? That's a great question. Yes. Info, Info Asset Planner is um, a different license than our traditional Info Master tools. And um, I would encourage you to reach out to your respective RSMs. There's actually programs in place at the moment to migrate folks um, over the course of the next year or two off of, of Info Master, whether it's water, sewer, or suite, onto Info Asset Planner. Now, the folks that are involved with Info Master currently are not going to notice um, a massive change when it comes to functionality of the products, 
but there's some tools that we are developing for Info Asset Planner. A couple of things that we're super excited about, myself personally, and we've been dumping our effort into Info Asset Planner moving forward. Um, and the idea is to be able to not just assess risk, not just go over our planning and prioritization and our ranking system for where risk lies in our system as a whole. But one of the things that folks have been asking for that I'm pretty excited to, to talk about today is that we are in development and will be releasing a little bit later on, I believe it's first thing next year, so early 2020, an Info Asset Planner. Uh, we've had folks asking us for a capital improvement plan uh, bundling. And so I've seen some neat things that folks have done, um, essentially taking a bunch of risky pipes in a regional, you know, certain part of your system. They're identifying hotspots in the system and they're creating capital improvement projects um, based on those hotspots. What we, what we will have here moving into the future with Info Asset Planner is actually a tool to bound each of those areas and then throw it out to your CMMS for a true capital improvement project. So super excited about that. Um, can Info Master be used with Arc Pro? That's a great question. And as you might imagine, we're getting a lot of questions about Arc Pro at the moment. Info Master cannot be used with Arc Pro at the moment and nor can Info Asset Planner. However, I can tell you that our developers are hard at work uh, because Info Asset Planner's the next tool that we will be building um, <clears throat> Uh, it, an Arc Pro integration for? So that's a good question. How many years might it take to go from to go from concept to fully implemented? Well, that's a great question. And boy, there's a broad range of answers for that. So I can tell, I can, I can speak to this uh, based on uh, the organizations that I've worked with. And so I think a lot of it boils down to what you have in place functionally at the moment. Um, if you're a medium to large organization, uh, what what typically happens is an asset management focus group or somebody who's kind of leading the charge will will have conversations with them, and uh, in a lot of cases they'll put they'll put together they'll deploy the software in about a year and a half. Um, that involves budgeting for it, you know, get, kind of getting it into the pipeline, starting to structure the folks that are going to be involved with it moving forward. Um, so going to con from concept to fully implemented, I'd say on average a year and a half, but that varies greatly. I mean, if you have, if, if you've, you're just one person in an organization, you can get this thing going. I mean, if you have a good understanding of your GIS data and the input information, if you're just an asset management guru, you really can put it together in a week or two. Uh, but I would say that cases like that are rare, and I think that those apply to some of our smaller clients, um, just because there's a lot less um, there's a lot less that goes into it from a resistance standpoint. Hey, we've got this tool; it could be great for our organization. Here's how it could be great for our organization. That's really easy to do when your organization is very small, and it can be very complicated when your organization is is very large. So we're rolling up on uh, one o'clock now, my time, Mountain. And so I think we I think we need to say goodbye. But I just wanted to say thank you to those of you who have um, who have joined us. And feel free to contact us moving into the future. I think you're all relative relatively familiar with your your regional representatives. Uh, we now have a pod system, and so we've we've got three folks that are assigned to each um, each client in the country, which is super exciting. And uh, I think we're a pretty responsive organization. So if you have any questions to follow up on this webinar in general, feel free to get in touch with us and thanks for attending. Thank you, Greg. We would like to thank everyone for attending today's session. If we didn't get a chance to answer your question today, we promise to get back to you.